When people make mistakes, why do they often give excuses rather than just owning up to, uh, to, to the situation that, and, and the fact that they've made a mistake? Now, let me ask you this. What is the dumbest excuse that you have ever heard uh, anybody give for a circumstance or a situation? I'm sure there's probably some things going through your mind right now uh, that they may either make you shake your head or make you laugh a little bit. So, so here's the question. Why is it better? to take ownership of our mistakes rather than to make excuses about them. Yeah, in just a few minutes, we're going to be looking at Saul's impatience and disobedience out of the book of 1 Samuel chapter 13. Stick around. We'll be back in just a moment. Hey folks, uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome to, the, to our Bible study of Central Baptist Church of Oak Ridge, North Carolina. Uh, just a moment ago, I asked you uh, uh, the question, why is it better to take ownership uh, of our mistakes uh, when we make them rather uh, than to bring forth excuses? Now, I know that there are probably uh, folks that are watching uh, our broadcast that maybe you've been in leadership positions and you've had some people uh, who work under you and you go to them and and you say, hey, why is this? Uh, why was this done this way, or why was this not done? And and all of a sudden, you start getting uh, excuses for why it's not done either properly or why it's not being executed the way that it's supposed to be. Um, we're going to look at at a mistake that took place, but you know, we got to be real careful as well because we don't want to just sit back and say, uh, just call call our sins mistakes. You know, we don't want to say, oh, I just made a mistake. You know, sometimes we just need to call sin, sin. Or how about all the time we need to call sin, sin. But if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn with me, if you would, to the book of 1 Samuel. It's an Old Testament passage, chapter 13. And we're going to look at, at verses 5 through 14. And we're going to look at how, how King Saul became very impatient. And because of his impatience, it created disobedience toward God. Again, that's 1 Samuel chapter 13. Uh, beginning with verse 5, and it reads like this. Uh, then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the, as the sand, which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped at uh, Mishmash uh, to the east of beth Aven. Verse 6, when the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, uh, for the people were distressed, uh, then the people hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. And some of the, the Hebrews uh, crossed over the Jordan uh, to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, uh, and all the people followed him trembling. Verse 8, then uh, he, he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and peace offering here to me. Uh, and he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened as soon as he had, had finished presenting the burnt offering that, that, that Samuel came, uh, and, and Saul went out to, to meet him uh, that, that he might greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed uh, and that the Philistines gathered together at, at mismatch, uh, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandments of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. Uh, for now, the Lord uh, would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him uh, to be a commander over his people because you have not kept uh, what the Lord commanded you. Let's pray together. Father, as we uh, come to you now, we do so, uh, Lord, with anticipation that you will speak to our hearts. Uh, Lord, we are so grateful that we have your word. We're so grateful that we, that we have your Holy Spirit to be able to lead us and guide us uh, along our path of life and along our journey. 
Now, Lord, I pray that you will truly help us to, to give ear to what the Spirit would have to say to each and every one of us uh, today. Uh, and Lord, may we truly be obedient to you in all that we say and in all that we do. And, and Lord, help us to, to make sure that we're tuned in to what it is that you are telling us. Uh, Lord, may we learn from your word today. May you bless this, your messenger, for these moments uh, that you truly would be lifted up and that you might draw all men unto you. So, Lord, bless our time together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when we uh, uh, look at our passages today and our story, King Saul grew impatient and he, and he became uh, disobedient simply because of, of his, of his uh, impatience. Now, uh, when you think about it, what were the circumstances that caused Saul to grow, grow impatient? Now, we see those in uh, uh, beginning uh, with, with verse 5 uh, and, and following through verse 8. Uh, he, he begins to see what's going on. The people are, are, are all scared of the enemy. Uh, and, and what was going on was uh, there was there was a circumstance and a situation. And I'm going to get to the scripture in just a minute. It, it, it comes up in chapter 10. Uh, you know, where uh, Samuel gave the orders uh, to Saul. He said, I'm, I'm coming to you within a, a particular period of time. Uh, and, and you have to remember that the way things were set up, uh, this is Old Testament. This is not New Testament. They were still under the law. They were still following what God had, had told them to do. It was the, the, the priest of the tribe of Levi were the ones that would go into the temple. It was the, those priests that were specifically set forth to uh, to offer the offerings on behalf of the people. Because you have to remember, in the Old Testament days, people couldn't just go directly into the presence of God. The only way that you and I, even in uh, this, this age of grace and in this New Testament day, the only way we can go into the presence of the Father is through Jesus the Son. Now, back in this day, Jesus had not arrived on the scene yet. He didn't live his 33 years. He hadn't been uh, crucified, uh, buried, and raised again for all the sins, past, present, and future of mankind. So yeah, in the Old Testament days, you have to remember, too, that salvation was expressed as it was counted to them as righteousness. Now, the best way for me to describe what that actually meant was uh, they knew that there would be a coming Messiah, and they believed in that to the point where uh, it was counted as righteousness to them. Uh, it, you couldn't really call it salvation because Christ hadn't been crucified and resurrected at that point. But they believed, Samuel believed with all of his heart that Jesus would come at a later date, that he would pay the price uh, for all of the sin of mankind. So I said all that to simply say it wasn't, uh, they didn't have the privileges that you and I have. They couldn't just bow their head and say our heavenly father and then him call you by name as one of his children. Yeah, you had to go through the, the, the priest of that day. You had to go through uh, the, the, the prophets of that day. So anyway, what's taking place here is, you know, essentially Saul does not have the spiritual right to be the person to offer that sacrifice, to, you know, to go into the presence of the Lord, to make that request. That's not uh, uh, biblically his position by which to do that. Now, you have to remember uh, that that Samuel uh, or, or that Saul had been walking with the Lord. You know, Saul had been you know doing a, a pretty good job. God had blessed him. God is the one uh, who allowed him the uh, appointment of king, and things had been uh, had been going fairly well uh, for him, as it were. Now, uh, if he would have just done what he was supposed to do, if he would have kept that order, so many times what happens is people get to the point where they feel like they are so close to God that the rules don't apply to them, that the word does not apply to them. Um, uh, one of the biggest examples I can think of in a, in a circumstance uh, such as, as we're talking about was when God said that the, the Ark of the Covenant, you don't touch it. You know, it. He designed how that Ark was supposed to be carried. He said when it was constructed, there would be you know, islets that would be put on the side and that poles would be slid through it and that the priest of the tribe of Levi would be the one's who would carry forth the ark. Now, we know that uh, there was disobedience from David later on when it came down to the ark uh, because when they transported it, they put it on a cart. They put it on an ox cart. That's not what God said. The word specifically says, here is how the ark is to be transported. Well, most of us know the story. What had happened was as the uh, ark was being transported, uh, it said the oxen uh, stumbled, and when it did, the ark shifted 
and a fellow by the name of Uzzah, who was walking uh, with, the, with the ark or walking beside the, the cart, reached up to steady the ark when the ox stumbled. And when he did, he touched the ark. And when he touched the ark, he immediately died. Um, you know, God said, you do not touch the ark. Um, so, you know, even though you know, a lot of us might sit back and say, well, Uzzah was just doing what was natural. Uzzah didn't want the ark to hit the ground. He was just doing something that was actually good. The bottom line is God said, you don't do this. And Uzzah did. Now, so how does all this relate back to our, our scripture that we're looking at today? Well, Saul uh, started getting a little bit too big for his britches. And when he got impatient because Samuel had not shown up, then what took place was uh, he decided he was going to take matters into his own hands. He was going to be the one who would uh, go forth and, and, and make the sacrifice. Now, when you think about his situation, does his impatience, does Saul's impatience seem like it's reasonable? Now, you have to remember, uh, Samuel said, I'm going to be uh, to you in a prescribed period of time. The word says it's going to be seven days. Well, then uh, Saul waited seven days. You know, Samuel doesn't show up. Uh, maybe he's wondering if he's going to show up at all. So then he goes on and does what he's not supposed to do. Folks, let me tell you, Satan is always going to make your impatience or your disobedience seem reasonable. You will sit back and say, well, you said you were going to do this and the time frame you know, is outside of the time frame. I just didn't think you were coming, so I went ahead and did it myself. You have to be extremely careful, particularly with the things that the Lord says, here is the prescribed method. Here is the way that this is to be done or not done. Uh, and, and you need to make sure you're tracking along with the word. It's it's not our place to try to rewrite what God has already stated or put in, in his word. Yeah, but for us, from the humanistic standpoint, uh, it does look like his impatience seemed to be reasonable. Um, <clears throat> man, I'll tell you why. One of the hardest things we do is have to wait on the Lord. In our society, one of the things that, that's tough is waiting on anything. We live in that instant society. We have the drive throughs we order online, we have overnight shipping, we have all these things because we don't like to wait. Uh, every time I think about a scenario like that, it reminds me back to my childhood when uh, I used to love uh, getting the cereal boxes and there would be some sort of a, a toy that you could get. Every now and then they would actually put the toy in the box and you know, you, you'd, you know, you're supposed to wait till you ate the cereal out of it, but I would always dig through it until I found it. But there were certain ones that the really good prizes uh, you had to eat about uh, what seemed like 97 bowls of cereal. You had to keep those proofs of purchase tops. Then you had to send it in. And man, it could be months before you saw that thing. And, and I know a lot of you all are probably grinning right now because you remember those days as well. You've just about forgotten that you even ordered it when it, when it arrived. So it's a, it's a surprise all over again. But we live in a, a society that is very impatient. We don't like to wait on anything. Uh, and then what we do is we look for excuses to justify us not waiting. And that's exactly what, what King Saul did as he, as he grew impatient with Samuel. Now, I want to carry you to a passage uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 8. And what we're going to look at are the specific instructions uh, that Saul received from Samuel. Again, that is 1 Samuel uh, chapter 10 and verse 8. And it says, it says this, it says, you shall go down before me to Gilgal and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of, of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. So this is the instructions. He, he was even very specific with it. He said, it is going to be seven days within that seven day uh, period of time is when I am actually going to uh, to come to you and uh, and and, and yeah, I'm, I'm going to take care of it. That's what it's going to be. Seven days. Well, did uh, did Saul wait around? No, I, I don't think that that, that Saul waited around uh, by any stretch of, of the imagination, as the word tells us. Uh, so you know, when you consider that, consider your life. Think about the things that God has told you, and think about how impatient we get. Uh, when it comes down to what God has instructed us to do. Saul knew what the instructions were specifically. He was even given the number of days. Seven days is what he said, uh, is what Samuel told him before I'll be there. Uh, now, uh, what part, think about it, what part of, of, of Samuel's instructions 
did Saul disobey? Now, you know, we can see that in what we just read because what happened was Samuel said, I will come down there. He was the one prescribed by God to do it. Samuel said, I will come. I will be the one who will, will offer the, the sacrifices. I will be the one who will go into the presence of the Lord. And, and yet Samuel was like, oh, I'll just do it myself. You know, it, but he didn't have the right to do it. Sometimes we can get a little bit too big for our britches, as the old boy would say, and, and we'll start doing things that we're not supposed to do. Um, think about those things. You know, what God has put in his word that, that is specific also applies to you. If you're not the person uh, that, that he calls to do a particular thing, then you better stay away from it because for you to do what God has said, I have prescribed someone else to do, uh, would be to be disobedient. Now, what excuse did Saul give for his actions? This is generally what happens. When, when confronted by Samuel, uh, uh, Saul gave an excuse, and we'll find that excuse in verses, uh, verses 10 through 12, where he says, uh, where it says, and now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting, now this is Saul, as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came, Samuel arrived, uh, and Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. So far, Saul doesn't see there being any problem whatsoever. I imagine he goes, hey, Samuel, glad you're here. Good to see you. And remember, it says he just finished uh, doing what he was not supposed to do. Saul had just finished offering those sacrifices. Now, verse 11 says, and Samuel said, what have you done, Saul? You know, when I saw that the, the, the people were, were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed, uh, and, and that the Philistines gathered together at Mishmash. Then I said, uh, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled to offer a burnt offering. Now, so what he's doing is he's actually starting to shift blame a little bit. You know, what he says to Samuel is he said, you know, you didn't show up in the seven days. So I went ahead, I just went ahead and took care of it because the enemy's breathing down my neck. I, I knew that I, I, I needed to make these sacrifices before the Lord. So I just went ahead and did it myself. Now, I love the, the latter part of verse 12 where it says, therefore, I felt compelled to offer a burnt offering. Let me read you verse 12 um, out of the English Standard Version. It says, uh, verse 12 says, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offerings. Now it's, now he's trying to hedge his bets a little bit. He said, I forced myself to do it because I knew that we just, you know, that, that I shouldn't, uh, you know, go into battle or that I wouldn't be taken care of without this taking place. So I just forced myself to do it, kind of. You know, coming up with the excuses, and remember, excuses are a dime a dozen. Satan will hand you an excuse for every piece of disobedience that, that, that you allow to happen in your life. Satan will say, well, here's the reason you did it, and it's a good excuse. How many times have we heard that, that expression? Well, was that a very good excuse? And some people say, well, yeah, it's a, a pretty good excuse along the way. The bottom line was God said, this is not your position to do this, Saul. This is what Samuel is supposed to do. Now, just like with any other disobedience, there are consequences uh, for actions. Let's look at verse 14. Uh, verse 14 says, um, um, but now uh, your kingdom shall not continue. That is a pretty stiff penalty for that, isn't it? Think about it again. Verse 14, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him uh, to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Mm. Wow, that's a, that's a pretty stiff penalty, isn't it? He says you're not going to you're not going to be essentially be king anymore. God has has sought somebody else because of your disobedience in this particular situation. You know, in God's eyes, why is partial obedience uh, why is partial obedience uh, the same as disobedience. You know, sometimes we sit back and say, well, I did half of it. This is a half truth. This is partial obedience. Well, partial obedience is complete disobedience. You know, it was right for him to want to, to, to have the sacrifices. It is right for him to, to want to have God on his side as they, uh, to protect them as they were to go, were to go into battle. 
But the problem was he was disobedient because he was the one who went and offered the sacrifices rather than Samuel. Even though that was <clears throat> partial disobedience, it, it, it wound up being complete disobedience, and it was costly. You know, In what ways can partial obedience be more dangerous than disobedience? Yeah, because it leads us to believe that what happens is that, that what we're doing is the right thing. Now, I want to share some, some passages that come a little bit later on in, in 1 Samuel. They're actually in chapter 15. Uh, but, but I want you to consider uh, the ways uh, that, that Saul continued to struggle with issues of obedience. Now, the, the passage is going to be uh, 1 Samuel uh, 15 uh, 7 through 9, as well as uh, verses 17 through 23. So 1 Samuel uh, 15, 7 uh, reads like this. It says, And Saul attacked the Amalekites from uh, Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people uh, with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared a Agag uh, and the, the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and, and worthless uh, that they utterly destroyed. Now, let me give you a little piece of what's going on. God had given him the command to go and utterly destroy everything. That means don't leave anything. Now notice what he did. This, this was Saul's marching order. Saul, you were to go down there and you were to completely annihilate everything. You know, all the people, all the, you know, the livestock, all the goods, you know, you're supposed to destroy them. Okay. So what did he do? This passage right here tells us that what he did was he, he kept Agag alive. And then down in verse nine, it says, uh, but Saul and the people spared Agag, the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. Okay? Yeah, here's the thing. Saul went into battle. Saul went, in, you know, went down there and, and did exactly what God told him to do with the exception of how it all ended. He said, utterly destroy it, and he didn't do it. They kept this. Oh, these are good sheep. These are you know, good fatlings, and, uh, and I'm going to keep Agag, but yet God's orders were you destroy them. So let me ask you this. If God said you destroy everything, and yet he kept Agag alive, and he kept the oxen and the sheep and the lambs and the fatlings and, and all the goods that, that they really like, is that being obedient to what God had asked him to do. And the answer to that question is emphatically no. God said you destroy it all. And yet Saul in and of himself comes up and, and, and pulls uh, something by saying, okay, well, this is what God told us to do, but here's what we're going to do. Now, if you go down a little bit further uh, in, in verse 17 of that same passage, 1 Samuel chapter uh, 15, it says, so Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the, of the, the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord appoint you as king over Israel? Now <clears throat> the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoils and, and, and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Hmm. See, he's put, he's put it right out there. I'm telling you. Uh, you know, Samuel is, <clears throat> is making no bones about uh, the particular disobedience that, uh, that had been displayed right there. He said, look, God told you to do this, uh, and, and you did part of it. You went on the, the, the journey to go in there, but, but you did not listen to what he said. Why is it that we have such a hard time in listening to what it is that God has to tell us? Why is it that, that we are, are so uh, about, um, uh, about you know, not listening to what it is that God has to say to us? God had, was very specific. He told him, you destroy everything. Don't keep any of the goods. You know, don't keep any of the people alive. And yet what he did was Saul had his own plan. You know, I, I, as we've done our Bible studies, I've always asked you to look for, uh, one of the things I've asked you to look for is an attitude to change. 
So when you think about that, what important uh, life lesson did Saul learn about partial obedience? And what lessons can you and I learn? Do we have an attitude in and of ourselves that needs to change uh, concerning partial obedience versus full obedience? And when you think about that, as the Holy Spirit has brought that to your life, how can you make application to this in your life? You know, when God has said, this is what I want you to do, that's exactly what he means. He doesn't want you to vary from it. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. And that plan and purpose is going to be what is going to be best ultimately for you and I. Now, when Samuel said uh, that the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart to replace Saul as king, uh, who was it that he was referring to? Now, most of us know that because that's been a, a descriptor uh, of, of a particular or the king that, that followed Saul. So when you hear the words, a man after his own heart, what name comes to your mind? David, that is correct. King David was the one uh, who, was, who was considered to be a man after God's own heart. Now, David had his own issues, uh, but think about what does it mean to be a man or a person after God's own heart? What, what does that really, really mean? In other words, it's that you want to do what it is that God wants done. I mean, yeah, David had his issues, he had his, uh, he had his ups and downs, but for the most part, he wanted to do what was right in following the Lord, often to the detriment of his own. You know, I, I, I think about you know, how obedient he was, particularly to the, 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 the scriptures that he knew. Now, again, I, I realize he messed up with Bathsheba. That actually ought to be some encouragement for you and I, because even, uh, even as David was as classified and considered a man after uh, God's own heart, he still messed up and he still had issues. So there's hope for, for, for you and I as well. Uh, but, but think about that. God is looking uh, for some people after his own heart. Do you consider yourself a person after God's own heart uh, that, that you're going to listen to what he tells you to do? You know, it's so ironic how many times people don't listen uh, to what God says when they've heard him very, very clearly. A classic example of that is, is Jonah. Remember, God went to Jonah and he said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Where did Jonah go? He went the opposite direction of Nineveh until God had to get his attention and bring him back. You know, why is it that we sit back and God says, here's what I want you to do. And we go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then we don't do it. You know, to be a person after God's own heart means you want to follow what it is that he is leading you to do. It means that you have the, the, the heart that he has or you're striving to have the heart. Uh, that he has. So remember what my question was a moment ago. Do you consider yourself a person after God's own heart? Consider that in your mind as the Holy Spirit leads you and convicts you in this, you know. In what, what ways is obedience to God a matter of the heart? You know, think about that for a moment. You know, you have to decide. You know, I've often said this, one of the greatest things that we can do is pre-decide that we're going to follow God, that when it comes up, and it's, it's like that old adage of the devil on one shoulder and, a, and an angel on the other, you need to pre-decide that you're going to listen to what it is that God has to say, that you're going to go God's ways. And oftentimes, we don't do that because we want what's going to be best for us in the moment. You know, we want to eat, drink, and be merry. You know, we want to uh, take advantage sometimes of God's grace by saying, well, if I go ahead and do this, then God will forgive me. You know, it's kind of like that old expression, you know, sometimes it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. We operate at times on that premise and we do the same thing spiritually as well. You know, why is it better to wait on God than to rush ahead with our own plans? Well, there's a, a ton of reasons, but I can simply begin by saying that God does have and know what the ultimate plan for your life is. And his word tells us that he has our best interest in heart along the way. So why would we not want to go with God's plan for our life? See, what happens is often we find ourselves like Saul. We get impatient. When we want something, we want it now. Uh, you know, like the old song says, sometimes the waiting is the hardest part. And instead of waiting, what we do is get impatient and we begin to plow forward. The only problem is when we do that, we generally plow forward with our own plans rather than what God's plans are. Uh, so it is far better to wait on God than to go rushing ahead with uh, our plan, okay? Uh, in, in what ways you know, can you continue to grow in, into a person after God's own heart that you want to follow him? Well, it all starts by uh, having that intimate 
relationship with him. How do you have an intimate relationship with him? You do that through his word. You do that uh, through your prayer life. You do that uh, through viewing the circumstances and situations, looking for the, 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 the opportunities that God places in our lives every single day. How many times do we just look past God's leading in our life in circumstances and situations and we just you know, completely let it go by? Uh, I've said this many times, God is in the midst of your circumstances and situations. I love the passage of Peter where Peter's walking on the water and one of the gospels uh, brings up a point uh, that only that particular gospel brings out. It says that when uh, the disciples were out there on the sea, they, they thought they were going to die. The boat was being tossed to and fro in this bad storm. Uh, and it says that they saw Jesus. Uh, and one of, the, one of the gospels, I believe it may be Mark, says this. It said, and Jesus intending to pass them by. Now, Jesus is out walking on the water. These guys are over here uh, battling the waves, thinking that they're going to die. Uh, you know, they needed to notice Jesus was in the midst of their circumstances. You know, I think Jesus would have walked by and, and then walked by again and then walked by again. So let me, let me just make it uh, really plain and simple. Jesus is walking through the midst of your circumstances and situations. Most of the time, he's just simply waiting on you to acknowledge the fact that he is there and to call him into those circumstances and situations. Isn't that a great thought? Listen, if you're, if you're at that point right now where you feel like you're at the end of your rope, start looking around. I promise you that the Lord is in the middle of that situation somewhere. You just got to see him. Cry out to him. And I love what Peter said in that passage. He said, Lord, if that's you, let me come to you. I love that. Uh, it wasn't that Jesus wasn't willing to go to them. Peter said, let me, uh, let me come out where you are. And Jesus said, come on uh, and think about the lessons. Think about the steps of faith. Think about being held up as he walked across the water on his way to the presence of the master. And then his faith wavered. Then he began to sink. And Jesus said, man, you were doing so good. Why did you doubt? Man, you didn't sink until you started to doubt. Listen, folks, we need to trust the Lord. Uh, can we do that? What we need to do is that we need to pray for one another today to be a person after God's own heart like King David was. You know, that didn't mean he didn't have his problems, so that's good news for you and I. But let's pray for one another today that we would become the person after God's own heart. I'm going to do that in just a moment. Before I do, I want to go ahead and give you what uh, your Bible readings for this week will be. This week, we're going to be looking at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16 through 1 Samuel chapter 20. Once again, that's 1 Samuel chapter 16 through 1 Samuel chapter 20. Next week, we're going to discuss David and Goliath out of the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 31 through 58. We hope that you can join us. Uh, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer as we close out our time around God's word today. Father, as we uh, come to you now, we're praising you and thanking you for the fact that you do lead us, that you do guide us, uh, you will never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, you have a plan for our lives and your plan is perfect. Uh, Lord, help us. Father, we, we try to be careful not to pray for patience because, Lord, we realize that the way patience is developed within us is through those trials. But, Lord, rather we come to you praying for wisdom today. Uh, help us to, to seek your timing in each and every circumstance and event of our lives. And, Lord, we realize that your timing is not always our timing. Help us to be on your time frame to be able to do uh, things your way that they might be pleasing to you and beneficial to us. So, Lord, help us as we draw close to you uh, uh, each and every day. Lord, draw us closer and closer day by day. Help us to get into your word. Uh, help it to uh, truly penetrate our hearts. And, Lord, I love the word uh, that, 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 that says, uh, Lord, help us to hide your word in our heart that we might not sin against you. Now, Lord, I pray you'll give us a good week. Help us uh, to have vision to see you in and, and about our lives as we go through uh, life on a daily basis, whether it's in the workplace, at home, in our communities, neighborhoods, wherever we are. May we be a true example of what you want us to be that we might point people in your direction. So give us a great week, Father. This is our prayer that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, God bless you. I look forward to uh, seeing you Sunday in the house of the Lord if you're in the area of Oak Ridge, North Carolina. We're located at 1715 Highway 68 North. We would love to have you stop by and visit with us. God bless.